Krishna. Hello. Hello. Welcome to you. And you, you want to hear something funny? Yes, yes. I actually was going to wear a white jacket as well. <laughs> and I tried to put it on, but due to COVID, I've gained 10 extra pounds and I couldn't get my arms through the jacket. So <laughs> here go the black jacket that I have on today. You look fantastic. <laughs> so thank you for joining me. And I just love, 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 love books. So let me start by saying that. Um, I thank you for joining me today, Miss Tanya Aikens. Tonya. Tonya Aikens, yes. Okay. Um, the president and CEO of Howard County Library Systems. And let's talk a little bit about your background. I'm going to read a little bit. Okay. A nationally recognized, let me start over. Tanya is president and CEO of Howard County Library Systems, Howard County Library Systems a nationally recognized five-star library for delivering excellence in public, edu public education for all ages. Howard County Library Systems consistently earns the highest five-star ranking attained by fewer than 1% wow, of public libraries in the US and remains the only library system in Maryland to do so. Tonya, is keenly focused on building the collective leadership of the organization, its partners, the community, and customers, and serves to provide equitable, high quality educational opportunities for all. She, she being Tonya Akins, has directed library services for more than 20 years and is very passionate about the ability of libraries to transform lives and communities. Tonya has served on numerous nonprofit boards and currently serves on the Community Action Council of Howard County's Board of Directors, the Local Children's Board of Howard County, the Maryland Public Library Administrator's Intergovernmental Task Force, <laughs> and is an appointee of the Maryland State Librarian to the State Library Resource Center Oversight Commission. She has served on county executive currently, Calvin Ball's transition team and spending affordability advisory committee. She is a member, Tonya, of Howard County General Plan Updates Planning Advisory Committee. So that's you? Me, that's me. All right. Me. So welcome, Tonya Akins. Thank you for joining me today on Talking with It's Janice. Me, your host, Janice McLean Deloach. I'm so glad you could join me. Thank you so very much for having me. It is definitely a pleasure. Yes, beautiful lady. So I like to start sometimes with things that are funny. At least I think that they're funny. And um, so here's a couple little jokes and then we're gonna okay. get into the rest of the interview. I asked the librarian if the library had any books on paranoia. What do you say to that? <laughs> she leaned over and whispered, <laughs> so a chicken walks into the library and says to the librarian, book, book, book. The librarian hands out three books to the chicken. And on the way out, the chicken runs into a frog and shows him the books and says, book, book, book. The frog replied, read it, read it, read it. <laughs> All right. And then lastly, I asked the librarian if she would direct me to self-help books. And she said, doesn't that sort of defeat the purpose? <laughs> so yeah, so there's that. Okay, tell me a little bit about your mission. Yes, absolutely. So our mission at Howard County Library System is high quality public education for all. And we are very intentional about making sure that we really are for all. That's where the equity piece comes in. And so we have done, taken many measures to begin engaging with community to see whom um, we may need to serve more and or different um, in the ways that we have uh, previously or traditionally. Um, who is missing from that customer base, who is not reflected maybe in our classes or collections and making sure that we do really represent uh, and are providing for a very diverse community. Okay, so 
tell me if you would, or tell us, the people who are watching and listening, how you're adapting to COVID and the pandemic pivot is this new word that I hear we're calling it. Indeed, indeed. Well, we've had a couple of pivots, you know, since the, the outset um, of the pandemic. Um, immediately, our, our team of instructors, uh, just phenomenal in getting our classes and events a transition to the online space uh, for both uh, live online classes and on-demand classes via our YouTube channel. Everything from children's uh, classes to book clubs to art tutorials with our, our adult education instructor um, to gardening in the yard with our master gardener. Uh, you name it, we were doing it. We have a DIY center, a do-it-yourself education center at our Elkridge branch that lends tools and other resources um, for DIY projects. And, and that team were doing tutorials from their backyards um, to keep people learning and engaged uh, during the pandemic. Um, we were very early on able to connect students with uh, uh, homework assistance and STEM education classes um, and just making sure, um, again, that in any way that we can, that we are connecting uh, the community to our resources. And of course, we have contactless pickup of materials available uh, for folks as well. And that's just been a wonderful hit um, okay. in the community. Okay, wow. What are bundle bags? <laughs> bundle bags. So the contactless pickup was such a hit. And one of the things that our customers really missed was browsing the shelves in person. And so it's pretty much like having your own personal yeah. shopper where you can yeah. uh, select a theme and our staff will curate a bag of books for you or other materials. Uh, could include DVDs as well uh, on a certain topic. And there, there are over 30 themes to, to choose from at any given time. Okay, wow. So you you have a new blog. Tell me a little bit about your blog. Yes. Yeah, so our new blog, Chapter Chats, <laughs> was born okay. during the pandemic where we have several staff who are giving recommendations on uh, things that they are reading or things that are happening during the time that they are blogging and write about, um, whether it's something here locally or on the national scene. Um, hugely popular. So please check out Chapter Chats. You can connect with that via our website. Okay. So I know that, sorry guys, I know that libraries, um, I, because I'm really a library buff, I just absolutely love, love, love libraries and, and, and books. And it's just always really been such an interest of mine. Really, I, I should have probably gone into the direction of being a library and for a short time, I actually did work at one. Really? Uh, yes, I, I did. That. Yes, I did. Here in Baltimore. I, I, Wonderful. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I know that they play an important role in the community. Um, would you just talk a little bit about some ways that you guys connect the community through the library? Absolutely. You know, I really look at the library as uh, not only the community living room, so to speak, um, but the community bumping place, right? Where the one place um, in the community where you are very likely to uh, bump into somebody <laughs> outside of your normal your normal network or your normal mm -hmm. circles. Um, mm -hmm. You know, older adults with younger children, people of different uh, economic statuses, people across various professions and such. Um, so it is that it is that connector. And then we are very intentional um, through our programs and classes. Um, events like the longest table or in the pandemic, the longest virtual table uh, where folks will come out um, in the in-person space and share a meal together at just one long physical table or in the virtual space, we broke them out into breakout rooms to discuss uh, topics of interest uh, in the community and how we build a better Howard County together. Okay, I saw that. Is that what that is? Where you? Yes. Okay. For 400 participants this year. Wow. Um, in that virtual space. Yeah. Okay. And what kind of topics do they talk about? This year, so our uh, speaker for this year was uh, Daryl Davis. Um, he lives in Silver Spring and is an acclaimed uh, musician and author and has had some very interesting conversations with members of the Ku Klux Klan and has talked to them about leaving the organization and through the conversations with him, many have left and have donated their robes 
to Daryl, who plans to open a museum one day um, with these robes. So it was really a conversation about what do we do about the problems around racism and, and how can we begin having conversations that respect everybody, no matter their perspective, uh, and, and really building better community through uh, discussion and discovery. Uh, and it was just a fantastic presentation that he gave. It is available via our YouTube channel. It's recorded and, and online there. Um, and then participants were able to just kind of go into a breakout space and connect with other community members to begin discussing uh, locally. Uh, how do we begin um, having these conversations uh, and sharing a bit with each other um, our experiences to build empathy and understanding um, and, and really just kind of remove some barriers there. Wow, that is absolutely amazing and it is wonderful. Beautiful. And um, uh, kudos to you guys for, for uh, actually having that, that uh, yeah. event or um, I guess activity for people to participate in the community. And I think, <clears throat> and this is just my personal thought, you know, I, I'm not psychology or therapy or any of that. Um, I feel like people are sometimes afraid of what they don't understand or they don't know. Absolutely, absolutely. And, yeah, and it sounds like you guys really exercised uh, in a space that people might now start to look at things a little differently. Wow, that's wonderful. Yeah, I mean, we really see it as, as another prong of education, right? When, when it's something that is misunderstood, that's an opportunity for better education in that space, right? And, and that's what libraries are charged with is public education. So um, we, we take up that charge even in the equity and uh, anti-racism space. Okay, uh, and so while we're talking about people being included in the conversation, would you talk to me a little bit about services that you offer for people who do not speak English or how are you uh, reaching out to the population um, who does speak another language other than English? Yes, absolutely. And thank you for that. Part of our strategic planning process uh, pre-COVID was to have uh, several of our team members go out and engage with the community where they are to really begin learning about the services that would be meaningful to them in a way that would be meaningful wow. to them, right? Mm -hmm. Because we may think, um, you know, that, you know, we've got a, a certain speaker, author, or a certain collection of materials that would speak to a certain community um, or people that speak a certain language, and it may not necessarily be what resonates with them. So, so going to the community and really asking for um, their feedback and their expertise on how to best serve them has really been the approach that we um, are taking. So, and in a myriad of ways, we do, of course, have several staff that are multilingual, um, but I really think it has to go beyond just speaking the language or translating materials to get to the heart of the service that, that, that people would really want, right? Um, and so that's what we're striving for. You know, I just want to say kudos to Howard County um, for being diverse, because I will tell you that, um, and not just in Maryland, but uh, in DC, and I, and I did tell you for a short time, I worked in a library. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I often have questioned the leadership and management chain with regard to diversity yeah. in areas like education, Mm -hmm. library systems, mm -hmm. banking, um, a, a number of industries. And sure. so I uh, salute Howard County for having a minority woman in this role and want to just hear your thoughts on what you think could be a good conversation to have about improving diversity and inclusion among leadership within library systems in general. Yeah, no, thank you for that. And I, I think one of the things that I always like to, to share with people is that for, for Howard County, obviously we are serving a very diverse community. Um, and so I am, am thrilled and honored to, to serve here. Um, but I'm also very transparent with people that it doesn't stop with having a person of color um, at the top. There, there's work to be done across the organization. Um, and we're only at the very beginning um, of doing that work. Um, so we've in no way uh, perfected everything, but we, so that first step is, is recognizing, right? That some things yes. have to change yes. um, and, then, and then beginning to uh, train your staff, which is what we are in the process um, of doing now. Um, 
And there are several levels to that. You know, it's not a box check for us where we're going to, you know, have a diversity training and say we're all done or, you know, <laughs> or higher, you know, because I mean, that happens, right? And we know that happens across all industries, right? And it's just, that's just not enough. And that's not the way it should be. And so we really do take this seriously and we want to be um, very intentional. I think there have to be very real conversations. Uh, and I say that with a smile because we have real uh, racial equity at the library, right. the acronym conversations internally um, around these types of things. Um, I think there has to be um, people exercising their influence, mm -hmm. um, quite honestly. Mm -hmm. um, and not everybody, you know, it is comfortable doing that and it takes some yeah. time. Um, and, and sometimes you're not able to, quite honestly, um, for fear of losing a job or, or what have you. Not everybody's in the right space for that, and that's and that's understood. But but I definitely and that's a very real comment. Yeah, that is, and, and it, because it's true, you know, it really is. I think mm -hmm. you know we we one of the things that that I've learned is that yes, there are systemic issues everywhere, but the systems are people. So it's not just the system, it's it's the people. And so it, it's incumbent upon all of us to, to do something if we want to see change, um, not just that other person or that other system or what everybody, right? Um, systems don't operate without people. So it's the people taking responsibility. Um, and when you are in a, in a position of leadership and influence, then you have to exercise that influence. Recently, I had a panel with three white women and I called them my sisters from another mother. Yeah. And uh, we talked a little bit about the COVID-19 and the pandemic. Um, there were clearly a lot of um, racial uh, tensions that, were, that boiled over uh, for a number of reasons. And uh, we're dealing with COVID-19 and you know, a lot of people have died, we know. Um, and in a time where we look at all of the negative about COVID-19 and the pandemic, um, we also noticed some good things. And my, my three sisters who are all ca Caucasian, uh, one thing uh, that um, I really appreciate just um, growing up uh, from my own background and my, ch my childhood, my parents was that they, ne they always allowed me to have whoever I wanted for friends. And, uh, and I was always in a space where I had different, you know, friends and diversity and genders. And, and so that's never really been an issue for me, but um, there were some good things that came out of COVID-19. We are able to have these kinds of conversations now, more so than we've ever had before. And um, there are a number of Caucasian people who wanted these changes, who want Absolutely. equality and want balance. And, um, for fear of losing a job or retribution, because there are some of, you know, they're, they're going through their own version yeah. of discrimination too. So they don't necessarily speak up, but when you look at the people who were marching in the streets this time, clearly a lot of them were home because we're, you know, not being at work and not being at school or whatever, right. but they were also waiting for the moment that they could be yes. an agent for change. Right. And so, um, you know, so what you said earlier about, you know, people not wanting to lose their jobs because we do know that there is system systemic racism, not just toward color, right. but gender, um, transgender people, you know, clearly um, across the board. So I applaud you for that. Thank you. Uh, speaking of reaching out to the community, libraries are often regarded as safe refuge refuges for homeless and underserved populations. How have you guys been able to service this particular population with the libraries being closed uh, due to the pandemic? Yeah, yeah, thank you for that. You know, that was one of the, the very first things um, we thought of, especially around this community um, and their um, potential lack of access to technology um, at a time where everything went online. Um, and um, just really honestly being uh, deeply concerned about how we were going to uh, not only secure devices um, and hotspots, you know, connectivity um, for folks, but then how do we get it in their hands, right? How, how do we find them? Right. Um, mm -hmm. Those types of things. And so 
we were able to um, very thankfully and gratefully um, receive CARES Act funding um, from uh, the county, um, Dr. Ball, thank you, uh, and from uh, the Maryland State Library as well that we put toward um, the purchase of Chromebooks and hotspots um, so that those that community would be able to connect with us, uh, our classes, our events, and everything that was happening for everybody else. Um, the uh, created while well isolated blog where people were sharing their experiences in Howard County throughout the pandemic. Um, so finding a way for those folks to be able to engage with us as well. And we were intentional about partnering um, with uh, agencies that are serving those populations. So um, grassroots, uh, Fern, uh, you know, those types of places um, so that we could uh, make sure that they were able to get uh, the devices into the customer's hands. Um, and that has just wow. been phenomenal. And, and honestly, it, it was only a small dent in a very large problem. And so we're, we're glad to see that there are these conversations along with the racial equity conversations, this digital divide conversation yeah. um, happening more earnestly um, now, even you know, in, in the uh, state legislature and, and nationally so that we really can um, close the gulf that, that exists for okay. folks. Yeah. Right, uh, because that leads, you know, the disparity is not only um, due to, to being minority, but also poor people get left out of the conversation and there are poor people in, in, right. in every background. That's so, right. Yeah. Um, wow. Wonderful, wonderful job you guys are doing. Um, and I just absolutely love libraries, but I have to tell you, I hope my home library is not looking because they would know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I said, you know, the one time that I really need the library to be open, you know, what am I going to do with these kids? I got to get out of this house. I need somewhere to go. <laughs> you know, they, you know, they had nothing to do. And I was, you know, like, and I love going to the library and they have so many activities and so many programs. And I said, this is the one time that we need the libraries to be open in their clothes. And, you know, but they also have to look out for their employees as well. Absolutely. And also look out for the population as well. So I understood it, but I was a little frustrated <laughs> at first. <laughs> Okay, that, that we're uh, frustrating for all of us. I, I agree yes. with you. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Would you talk a little bit about uh, the free educational resources that you offer? Sure, absolutely. There are a myriad of resources. I'll try and, and touch on uh, at least some of them and highlight some for you. Okay. Um, of course, we have our, our um, physical collection of books uh, and DVDs um, and music uh, CDs and such audio books. Um, that are in the physical space. Um, uh, we lend STEM kits uh, and in the future art and literacy kits coming uh, online that you can check out. Um, on the virtual side of things, um, we do um, electronic books, we do electronic magazines. You can have a, you know, the latest issue of Fast Company delivered right to your device with your Oh, library. wow. Oh, okay. yes, absolutely. Okay. <laughs> right. I mean, there are a whole, you know, suite of, of um, periodicals that you can have um, subscription to for free. Mm -hmm. um, there are many newspapers that you can access and get behind the paywall with your library card. Um, so you want to take advantage of that as well. We do Cisco certification. Um, there are a whole suite of um, learning uh, uh, classes, wow. resources, over 300 classes, probably over 700 on lynda.com, which is part of LinkedIn mm -hmm. uh, learning. Um, you name it, it's there. And that's just some of it. Um, we have test prep uh, materials for the LSAT, you know, um, and, a, and a variety of other uh, professions. So what's the LSAT for those people who Yes, yeah, so we've got everything that you would you would need to prepare for to take you know the uh, exam to become a postal service worker to become a lawyer to become a, a psychologist. I mean, you've got all of these uh, in preparation for the exams. Um, those course materials wow. are available for you online. Wow. Yes, I'm telling you, you guys really are amazing. Thank you. Do amazing things. Um, now. The purpose of the library is to preserve history and more importantly, truth. And we're talking about adjusting to new normals. And we've talked about natural, well, we didn't talk about natural disasters. Is there anything that we need to talk about with natural disasters? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> you talked about <laughs> curbside pickup and all of that. And the, and the, and the um, what was it? The to-go bags. Um, bundle bags. Bundle bags. So we talked about that. So 
I just wanted to uh, ask you, is there anything else that you would like to share with people um, just about what you're doing, the work you're doing, what you want to do? What's new for you guys in 2021 and beyond? Yes, absolutely. Well, we're, we're building on our racial equity initiative that is still fairly new for us with, you know, providing training both for our staff and community with renowned trainers from the Racial Equity Institute and the Soul Focus Group in partnership um, with our initiative partner, Equity Matters. Um, we're collecting stories across the community about racial equity experiences in Howard County to really get a baseline of what's happening here um, and to help people make sense of uh, uh, what is happening in their in their own backyard. And then also we are uh, beginning mobile service in 2021. We have a, a early learning uh, unit or van that is being outfitted that will service the zero to three community and their caregivers. Mm -hmm. um, we'll bring early learning materials and instruction to them where they are. And this is one of those equity initiatives as well. Um, we'll be in communities, we'll be at preschools and our partnership with CAC Head Start as well. Wow, wow, awesome. <clears throat> Amazing things that you guys are doing. And Tonya Akins, before you go, I just want to uh, give a little bit of history this is something that I learned that the year 1876 is key in the history of librarianship in the United States. The American School Library was founded in 1839. Philanthropists, can't talk, philanthropists and businessmen, including John Passmore Edwards, Henry Tate, and Andrew Carnegie helped to increase the number of public libraries from the late 19th century. Carnegie, who made his fortune largely in steel production uh, and construction, devoted a great deal of his fortune to philanthropy and public libraries. And then also uh, in African-American libraries and literary societies. The history of African-Americans and libraries in the United States is one with a rich heritage. The earliest established library started by excuse me, and for Amer African Americans in the U.S. was the Philadelphia Library Company of Colored Persons. By 1838, its collection included 600 volumes, as well as pamphlets and maps. Members could read independently or follow a scheduled course of study. The, Bef the Bethel Literary and Historical Society had a lot to do with that. <clears throat> and strangely, once again, excuse me, Andrew Carnegie, had a lot to do with making sure uh, that the African-American libraries were established. So, wow, no, no. kudos yeah. to him. And uh, so uh, African-Americans do read. We have a yes, history indeed. of reading. <laughs> yes, indeed. Yeah, starting in 1881. We read and we write. Yes. Yes, yes. Okay, wow. Now, going out, <clears throat> I got, just one more joke for you. Yes. Did you hear about the librarian? Oh, no, I don't think we want to do that one. Did the <laughs> library say to the child? What did the library say to the child? Hmm. Do tell. <laughs> Read more. Love it. Absolutely. So on the way out, guys, that's the tip for today. Since we're talking about libraries and reading. Read more, read often, utilize the systems and services that you have that are available to you uh, through the Howard County Library System and any public library uh, or private one for that matter that you can, can get to. Tonya Akins, President and CEO, Howard County Library Systems. Thank you. Thank you so very much for having me, Janice. It was my pleasure. Okay. All right, guys. Thank you for listening to and looking at this session of Talking with Janice with me, your host, Janice McLean-Deloach. See you guys next time. <laughs>